Hi, I'm Sandy with HEART. We're a group called Hatfield Equity Alliance Fighting Racism Together here in Hatfield. And we've been meeting for three years. And we're here tonight because this is an informational meeting about change the mass flag and a redesign. We're here with David Detmold. He's the coordinator of changethemassflag.com. And he's going to give us some information about redesigning the mass flag. We are one of the only towns in our area that has not already passed this. We'll have a chance to vote on it at our town meeting May 9th. I hope you will enjoy this video and come and vote for changing the mass flag at our town meeting May 9th. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sandy. And everyone from Hart in Hatfield who has, yep, I don't need that because I have my own. And everyone in Hatfield uh, from the Hart organization that have been through all kinds of weather for the last several years, uh, doing a monthly standout. I think it's on the first Saturday of every month at about 11 o'clock, if that's right. Um, and rather than just beep and wave, get out of your car and join them, okay? Because it's wonderful the work they're doing. And, and I feel very honored <clears throat> to be invited here tonight to talk to you for a little while and to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, regarding the grassroots effort to change the state flag of Massachusetts. And when we say the flag, we're really talking about the state seal of Massachusetts, because our flag is based directly on, on the seal. And you may say to yourself, well, other than uh, an, an endangered aquatic mammal, what is a seal to us in Massachusetts? Uh, seals uh, used to have a great uh, importance to not just the colony of Massachusetts, but the state of Massachusetts, and every state and town and city government had their own, and still do have their own seal. It's an actual device uh, that in time past, in the older days, um, was used to verify such things as invoices, bills of lading, to determine that this actually was the official stamped document that came from the hands of the, you know, perhaps the royal governor in the, co in the colony of Massachusetts Bay C Company, and I, I, the Massachusetts Bay Colony. And I, I want to refer back to the original seal of Massachusetts. And you'll see that some of the elements in the original seal are still with us today on our state flag and our state seal. Uh, seals aren't in, in common use, but, but you can go to your town clerk and get a stamp from the town clerk of Hatfield. It'll have a little raised uh, metal profile and it'll stamp right into a piece of paper to document that this is a true and attested document of the town of Hatfield. Similarly, this is the seal that the Puritans brought over the year uh, that they sailed into what was then considered Shawmut, uh, Massachusetts indigenous community called Shawmut. Now that is called Boston and Boston Harbor, a safe harbor for the Puritans to land and start their, their colonial enterprise, which was really a commercial endeavor uh, with the view of uh, reaping profits for the shareholders back in England from the resources of this vast uh, continent that uh, the colonial powers were just beginning to nibble on the edges of. Uh, and Britain didn't want to be left behind. Spain had already colonized Florida, and uh, uh, there was an attempt to start a, another little colonial settlement, as you know, um, in Virginia. And then the pilgrims came over uh, and landed uh, in what used to be called Patuxet, and uh, was a very safe harbor where the Cape just joins uh, the mainland. But that uh, native community of Patuxet had been completely depopulated by a viral plague that made uh, 
made COVID look tame by comparison. And, and uh, there was more than a 90% mortality rate uh, for the native people who lived along the coastline. Uh, uh, at the time the pilgrims arrived, um, uh, some of the passing ship captains had noted the, the great decimation of the population and said there were not enough living left to bury the dead. So the pilgrims came and uh, brought about 100 people for that first terrible winter of starvation. Uh, they didn't have enough supplies to get through the winter. The Wampanoags, who had been the, the victims of this plague, which might have been smallpox, it might have been another viral disease. Anyway, they were very uh, weakened themselves and felt like they could enter into an alliance with this new group of uh, newcomers on their shores. And uh, actually, we consider um, their leader to be called Massasoit. Massasoit is the name given for the, the leader of that tribal nation. And his actual name was Usamequin, the Massasoit. So he was the chief sachem. He signed, not a signature, but he agreed to a peace treaty with the, with the pilgrims. And, um, and the Wampanoags feel like for their part, they have kept that treaty ever since. Uh, but certainly for many years, there was peace. And um, they really did, I think, save at least half the pilgrims from starvation that first winter. So I think it's good to focus on the origins of all of this and how there was at first peace, peaceful relations, and a mutual need uh, for uh, mutual support between the, the colonial uh, settlers who came to, to what is now Massachusetts. And so nine years had passed since the pilgrims had landed and there had been discussion as ships went back and forth as to how the conditions were. And the Puritans were in a much better position financially than the pilgrims. Uh, and they were really, uh, well supplied, they came over with 30 ships, and um, they were looking toward the fact that this, these were the most abundant uh, fishing shoals anywhere that had been discovered right off the coast. It's not called uh, uh, Cape Cod for nothing. Uh, the cod were so plentiful. And also the pine trees, uh, Massachusetts as a colony at one point included all of Maine. and. Uh, as England became a stronger and stronger maritime power, uh, they needed uh, the, the lumber, really, from their new colonies here, and particularly those huge, straight, tall, white pine to make perfect masts for the, for the burgeoning fleets of the British Empire. So for them, this was a colonial enterprise. And even the year before they came, this was 1629 that they first forged this seal in metal and, and uh, began to use it. Uh, and this was their imagined view of what a native person might look like. They hadn't arrived yet. They came a year later. And their imagination included a kind of clothing that native people feel insulted to, to even imagine that anybody would have ever worn a loincloth made of leaves like that or shrubbery that's just totally embarrassing to them and uh, offensive. But also, look at this speech balloon that comes out of the native person's mouth in the Massachusetts Bay Company seal. It says, come over and help us. And um, I keep thinking maybe that was a translation error and it should really have said, come over and help yourself to our land. But nonetheless, this was the seal, come over and help us. There might be a, a, an indication, a biblical reference that uh, these uh, heathens needed uh, Christianizing or missionary impulse from the colonial settlers to, to bring the true religion to them, but they had their own religion. And, uh, and in fact, the, um, the uh, Puritans made no attempt to do any proselytizing for about 17 years after they first arrived. The first missionary uh, to the native people uh, came to Martha's Vineyard. Uh, 
uh, but that was at about the late eight, 1640s. So, so they weren't here uh, initially, or let us not be deceived that they were here to save souls, so-called. They were here to, um, to capitalize on the vast resources of this so-called new land, which indeed had been occupied for 10,000 years at least by people who were taking care of it very well. Um, I want to just point out just one or two other features here. The native person is shown carrying one downward arrow and no quiver on his shoulder and a bow in his other hand. So this was not the Puritan's conception of a native person ready to do battle. Um, had there been a quiver full of arrows and a more warlike pose, well then maybe. But even the Secretary of State's website now in Massachusetts refers to this as a peaceful native person or perhaps a pacified native person. And so this was the seal of Massachusetts until 1684. <clears throat> And just before we go to the next slide, I want to mention that 1684 is almost a decade after the, the, uh, the mutual, mutually destructive war that broke out, which is indeed the most uh, per capita, the bloodiest conflict that America, either in its colonial era or modern era, has ever experienced called King Philip's War by the English, or Metacom's War might be a better way to put it. Metacom was the second son of Usamequin, who I mentioned, the Massasoit of the Wampanoags. His elder brother, who the English called um, Alexander, uh, died mysteriously after visiting Plymouth, and the Wampanoag believed that he might have been poisoned there. Um, but in any case, after the father passed away and his elder brother, he became uh, the leader of his tribal people. Uh, and the English sort of felt there had to be somebody in charge when this war broke out, and so they laid it at his feet. But he was really more of a diplomat among many tribal nations who all rose up together uh, to push the English back into the sea from whence they came because they had been experiencing the th what they reviewed as the taking of their land by these documents that were completely un unfamiliar to them called deeds. Uh, native people, to them, land was not a resource to be exploited for individual profit, but to be shared communally. And so they didn't understand, I think it's fair to say from a cultural point of view, the concept that uh, land could be deeded out from under their feet and also uh, their cornfields were being laid waste by the settlers, uh, uh, farm animals, and there were frequent disputes over who was in charge of, of uh, reparations when their cornfields were destroyed, one thing after another. And there were the deaths of people on both sides. There were certainly examples where native people had been invited to meetings and then killed uh, by colonial settlers. So there had been, for some decades, peace was a relatively loose term for the relations that were developing here. And finally, there was a, a war, and the native people uh, fought hard to defend their land and their culture. And so this, this um, major conflict was 1675 to 1676. So this seal lasted and was in force until almost a decade after that, uh, at which point the uh, English Crown revoked the charter for the Massachusetts Bay Company. Uh, and they did that because of a couple of reasons. There was a feeling that uh, the religious plurality that would allow the Church of England to also have a place here in the new colony was absent in, in, in the Puritans' vision of, of how church and state should be one uh, through their, uh, you know, the town meetings took place at the congregational church, et cetera, and, and, and the crown was objecting to that at that point, and, but mostly it was about trade, taxation, and uh, who was in charge of the revenue from things that the colonial government was trading perhaps with the West Indies. And this 
reverberated again during the period called the Revolutionary War. But anyway, I'm just giving you a little of the historical background here. So at that point, the charter was revoked and a new seal came into place. Nobody's taught me how to advance these slides yet, so if you'll forgive me for just a moment with this. I may have to have a demonstration. Okay, this became the next seal of what we call Massachusetts, but at that point, uh, the King of England uh, decided that uh, he'd put all these colonial efforts, which were very much coastal enclaves with just a couple of towns here and there, like Hatfield, Northampton, Deerfield, Northfield, but mostly on the coast. And so Connecticut and Massachusetts, or Rhode Island, and eventually New York, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania were all rolled into this new uh, polity called the Dominion of New England for a brief period of time and was ruled by a royal governor in the king's stead whose name was Governor Andros. He was first in New York and then they appointed him and he came, I think, even to Boston for a year or two and did not meet with a very warm welcome. In fact, uh, in Ipswich, there's a little plaque right in front of their library uh, about the antecedent to the Revolutionary War, which took place in Ipswich when Andros took power and levied taxes that they felt were completely unfair and uncalled for and that they had no voice in. Uh, so there was a little bit of a revolutionary struggle even then in, uh, in uh, 1680, I think, or, or right about then. But what I want to point out here, just before we <coughs> move on to the next slide, is that once again you see the image of a native person, sort of this idealized vision from England's point of view of willing subjects of the crown kneeling with the fruits of the harvest being offered to, the, to their sovereign liege, when in fact, this is the period of time right after the struggle I mentioned, the King Philip's War, Metacom's War, and native people were being shipped by the boatload enslaved uh, to West Africa, to Spain, but particularly to the West Indies, where they worked and died in uh, the terrible conditions of the rum plantations, the sugarcane plantations, uh, where the mortality rate was close to 25% per annum. And so these were not willing subjects of the crown. These were enslaved people whose families were being broken up. At this time, it was uh, common and legal uh, to take young children from Mashpee families, uh, Wampanoag families in, in the township that we now call Mashpee, uh, and just put them on a whaling vessel without their parents' or family's consent and send them off to sea for four years, often never to return. Uh, Native people were enslaved in large numbers in Boston, in Providence, and in my hometown of New London, Connecticut, uh, whaling ports like New Bedford. Um, and we don't often think about slavery. Perhaps the society as a whole doesn't have this conception that Native people were enslaved in New England and were sold into slavery out of New England, and the trade in, 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 in this sort of transatlantic uh, slavery of indigenous people actually in some of these colonies in the, in the Northeast exceeded the number of black uh, African slaves who were sold into slavery also in these colonies. So it was a profit-making enterprise for these colonial entities to um, <clears throat> both remove the people who had resisted their colonization and had resisted that with arms <clears throat> and, but also to break up their families and destroy the resistance and to try to take their lands. And so I think that's a relevant point about this seal, which did not last that long, this particular seal. It was succeeded by, I think, a succession of 12 more seals of royal governors right up until John Hancock uh, and his Minutemen allies overthrew um, the use of that seal and the royal governor and uh, pushed them out of uh, the area around Beacon Hill 
<clears throat> and took over and began to run things for themselves as a revolutionary struggle took place not only here in Massachusetts where it really broke out to begin with, Lexington conquered Bunker Hill, <clears throat> but throughout the 13 colonies. And um, it was a hard fought struggle as everyone knows, but there are aspects to it that we forget. For example, uh, that the, the most powerful native confederation <clears throat> in, um, in North America at that time was uh, what we call the Iroqu Iroquois, or the Five Nations, or as they're properly called, the Haudenosaunee. And they were so militarily powerful and a number of their tribal nations allied themselves with the English in the struggle, the revolutionary struggle, that uh, George Washington uh, delegated a quarter of his troops in the second year of the revolution to go on what is called the Clinton-Sullivan campaign to upstate New York, what we would call nowadays upstate New York, and just to, one after another, destroy every uh, arable farmland, all the farm, farming lands of the uh, Haudenosaunee, and tore out their peach orchards and burned them, and just made it impossible for them to sustain themselves because of their military power and their, the fact that they were allying themselves with the, with the English in this struggle. So really, a large theater of war during the Revolutionary War was this campaign to uh, <clears throat> burn out the, the villages of the, of the Five Nations and to render them militarily neutral in this struggle. And uh, he succeeded, Washington succeeded, his, his captains succeeded in that effort. Uh, Native people in upstate New York were reduced to starvation that winter. They went to the British Fort Niagara uh, to, um, to try to sustain themselves through that winter and, and no longer were a military force to be reckoned with. After that, they called George Washington, and I forget the name in, in, in the native language, but they called him the village destroyer. <clears throat> anyway, this became the seal, the revolutionary seal for, Ma for, the, for the colony of Massachusetts which was now trying to throw off its colonial yoke and become a state. Uh, as we know, they succeeded with the other colonies. But uh, for five years uh, during the revolutionary struggle from uh, 1775 to 1780, <clears throat> Governor uh, John Hancock felt like they needed a new seal, a seal for their own you know, effort uh, as uh, the Massachusetts colony that was becoming its own. Uh, independent government. And so he turned to Paul Revere and asked him to come up with a seal. And this is Paul Revere's engraving. And this became for five years the seal of Massachusetts. And I would just say here's the sword for the first time. There is, it's a very Eurocentric seal. There's no reference to indigeneity or native people. There's uh, the Magna Carta being held in the other hand, which uh, is appropriate because that was uh, where the doctrine uh, was first enunciated of there should be no taxation without representation. So for five years this was our seal and it shows you how it has changed over time and evolved over time. In 1780, even before the struggle was over, Hancock turned to one of his uh, advisors on what was called the Governor's Council at that time what we might call a state senator today, uh, a man named Nathaniel Cushing, almost became a committee of one. He had uh, experience in heraldry, was a student of it, and he came up with this. And I've searched through the state archives and the special collections room of uh, the state house to try to find any indication of why he decided to go back in time but there's no written records uh, as to why he decided to revert to this uh, original symbol of a native person with one downward pointed arrow and no quiver, a pacified or peaceful Indian, uh, fully clothed at that time. Uh, but the sword, which had appeared there for five years in the Paul Revere seal, now has changed position and appears now above the head of the native person, 
and the speech bubble coming out of his mouth saying, please come over and help us is gone. And it's been replaced in a way by this Latin motto underneath, which remains in place today. In fact, all these basic elements are the basic elements of our state seal and our state flag today. Only the artistic rendering of it has changed. And this Latin phrase uh, is, uh, according to the Secretary of State's website anyway, commonly translated to say, she seeks a quiet peace under the sword, but peace with liberty. And again, from a native point of view, liberty was in very short supply. Uh, at this time, there weren't boatloads of native people being shipped to the West Indies any longer. But, uh, for example, if the Wampanoag, who had their own self-government for many, many centuries, I'm sure, wanted to hold a town meeting and govern their own affairs, they had to pay a white person to come to their town at quite considerable expense to run their town meeting. At this point in time, Native people were considered, quote, wards of the state, incompetent to run their own affairs the native people who remained in Massachusetts. So this was not a period of liberty for native people. She seeks a quiet peace under the sword, but peace with liberty. Um, it, artistic renderings of this changed over time. To me, this is a particularly scary looking one, <clears throat> but the basic elements remained as, as they are today. And finally, uh, the Secretary of State said, you know, sometimes the bow would be in the left hand, sometimes the bow would be in the right hand. The Secretary of State said, we want to make it a fixed image that will always remain the same and always being until the legislature decides to change it. And we'll get to that in just a moment. But in 1895, um, this became the fixed and the Secretary of State at that time felt final uh, rendition of really what began with that first Massachusetts Bay Company seal. And, um, and it, this is what we're looking at and living with today. And this is what we're teaching our children in grade school because as part of the core curriculum, uh, elementary school students year after year throughout the Commonwealth study this and learn from it. And, uh, it's obviously, and we know from the history, a, a white hand holding a sword. Here's the ruffled sleeve of a colonial arm holding a colonial broadsword above the head of a native person. And from a child's perspective, from a lay person's perspective, uh, really looking at this for the first time, that's, that's, I think, the most powerful aspect of this, is there's this sense of, the sword above the native person is certainly not what I say when I talk to grade schoolers, a very friendly image. But let's take it apart and look at it a little more carefully. Um, for one thing, native people were never consulted in the uh, final rendering of this. Uh, in fact, white anthropologists from some of the Boston universities were the main sources of reference for the illustrator who was hired by the Secretary of State. The Secretary of State at that time was a man named William Olin. It was his concern that this be fixed and finite and no longer subject to artistic renderings based on the artist's whim. And he asked a very well-known illus illustrator at that time named Edmund Garrett to do this work. And, uh, and as I say, Garrett, did not consult Native people. In fact, he referred to them in writing shortly thereafter as poor savages. Um, so if people say this was ever intended to honor Native people, I think it is possible to refute that um, with some confidence. But one thing is he chose the facial features of a Chippewa chief from Montana who Garrett considered to be a fine specimen of an Indian, quote unquote, um, to represent or to model the, f the features of the native person on the Massachusetts flag, um, a Montana chief. He chose the bow from 
a native person who was shot and killed 10 years before King Philip's War by a settler named William Goodnow in the town of Sudbury. 1665, we remember the name of the settler who shot and killed this indigenous person and took his bow, but we do not remember, history does not record the name of the native person whose bow we are still looking at today and teaching our children. Um, this, uh, well, to back up for a second, Garrett actually went and looked at the skeleton of a native person that was kept in a museum in Winthrop to make sure that he had the bodily proportions right, as if native people somehow have different bodily structures than everybody else. It was like a scientific study of a, of a skeleton to make sure that artistically it would be rendered exactly so. Uh, can you imagine if the situation had been reversed and King Philip's War had gone the other way and we were trying to find the ideal the skeletal structure of an ideal white person? And how would that feel to you if you were going to the elementary school and studying that? Um, the belt uh, binding the native's cloak here is considered to be the red flannel belt that King Philip or Medicom wore in battle and it's kept in the Peabody Museum in Hartford, I'm sorry, in Harvard, in Cambridge, along with, I would point out, many thousands of indigenous skeletons that are kept in that museum, despite the fact that there is a federal law now that museums are supposed to return all such objects to the tribal origin, to the, to, to the tribes where those those human remains originated. And once again, try to put yourself in their shoes and feel what it would feel like if, if somehow the dominant culture had felt it would be okay to disturb the bones of your ancestors and keep them as museum artifacts to study. Um, this is a terrible thing that uh, Harvard has yet to return all these skeletal remains and yet they are only one university that is holding so many, more than 100,000 native uh, human remains of native people are kept in, in, in museums and private collections and universities around this country still today, uh, more than 30 years after the passage of the Native American Graves Repatriation Act. And thank you, Senator Elizabeth Warren, for pushing for this to change. And thank you to our new uh, Secretary of the in Interior, uh, Deb Holland for uh, making it easier uh, for Native people to claim these uh, objects to be returned to them, these sacred artifacts, these sacred relics, and their, the bones of their ancestors, and yet still Harvard <coughs> is delaying on this. So I want to point out that's the belt of, they believe that's the belt of Medicom, and for sure we know that Secretary of State Olin told Garrett to use Miles Standish's sword as the model for the sword in our flag and seal. And suffice to say, Miles Standish, two years after that uh, first peace treaty, if you will, between uh, the Wampanoag and the Pilgrims, called a parley or a little conference with Massachusetts tribal leaders in a town we now call, um, which was then called Wessagusset which is just south of Boston, I'm forgetting the name of it right now, the, the, the current name. And he, held, he sat down at a table just like this with them on the other side and then they thought they were here, there to talk about peaceful relations and he ambushed them with his soldiers, killed them and cut off one of their heads and I'm afraid to say took it back and uh, posted it on the pike uh, on, their, on, their, um, on the palisade around their, their, their village to basically be a message to native people. Um, and the same thing happened to King Philip, by the way, when he was finally killed in the summer of 1676. They drew and quartered his body, they cut off his hands, sent one of the hands to the King of England and put his head on a stake in Plymouth where it rotted for 20 years. And there's a sign right in front of the Plymouth Town Hall that the indigenous people forced the town of Plymouth to finally acknowledge that this indeed was the historical facts of the matter. Um, and when we talk about savagery, um, there's much to be said on both sides. <laughs>
So, when Native people look at this, they remember this particular sword. Nowadays at town meetings when we discuss this, people often raise the argument that this sword is meant to symbolize the colonial struggle against England, although broadswords had long since passed out of use before the Revolutionary War. Be that as it may, they indeed chose this particular sword of Miles Standish, and I think in that a message was very clearly sent to Native people um, who remember this sword and its relationship to King Philip and the belt, the belt that is drawn on here. So I just want you to look at it from a Native person's perspective for a moment and, and to see that this, to them, as, uh, as the director of the Massachusetts Commission on Indian Affairs, Jim Peters has said in public hearings that I've attended, represents accurately the violent history of relations between the colonial settlers and the indigenous people who first welcomed them and saved them from their first winter of starvation here. And Native people have been saying for many, many years, it's time to change this. This is a terribly offensive symbol from their point of view and from, I think, many of our points of view. When we look at this, we see a memorial to genocide. We don't see a colonial struggle. We see a struggle of colonial violence against Native people. This is the Sagamore, the leader of the Massachusetts tribe at Ponkapog. We've taken the name of his tribal nation for our state and taken all the land that his tribal people once, once cared for. They have actually no acreage left in their name, unlike the Mashpee Wampanoag who have a tiny little reservation right on the uh, ocean's edge uh, in Mashpee. Or the Akinna Wampanoag who have one tiny corner of Martha's Vineyard uh, still uh, in their possession. The Massachusetts tribe in particular has been dispossessed, dispossessed of their land, their name has been taken, and they are forced to now look at this symbol uh, flying above the state house, and their, their children go to our public schools as well and study this. So, so this was in um, <clears throat> November of uh, 2019 when hundreds of people came to a hearing at the state house uh, saying the time has come to change the flag and seal. There had been a bill uh, pending for, um, for 34 continuous years to set up a special commission uh, to study <clears throat> the elements of the seal just as we've looked at them today. And uh, that bill had been stalled in the legislature for all that time. It was introduced by a great African-American legislator and uh, civil rights icon from Boston named Byron Rushing. He was working with uh, Jim Peters' father at that time, John Slow Turtle Peters, the medicine man of the Wampanoag, who was the former director of the Massachusetts Commission on Indian Affairs and died before this change ever came about. Uh, it took so many decades. And finally, uh, and I'm embarrassed to say this, uh, it was only when white majority town meetings, not not as if Native people hadn't been calling for this to change for 50 years. They have. But only when uh, uh, town meetings, just like the one here in Hatfield, which is about to vote on this, raised their voice and said, we believe this should be changed. Only then did the legislature finally act. And um, with that, I want to say uh, we started that effort with town meeting votes in right here in Franklin County, just a little bit north of Hatfield, in the towns of Gill, uh, Wendell, um, New Salem, and Orange. Orange, which had just voted in the majority for Donald Trump over Hillary Clinton two years prior. In 2018, became the fourth town to vote to change the flag and seal. So this is a subject which has passed in uh, liberal enclaves like uh, Le Leverett, Amherst, Provincetown. This is something that has passed in towns that are considered more conservative, quote unquote. And I'd like to just remember that conservative is, is uh, not a term, is a term of values, of maintaining certain cultural values, which I think, you know, I respect and, um, and and I think that in 
all these towns that we've brought this up to, and now 61 towns have voted, taken formal votes, and we've won this in 59, this resolution to change the flag and seal, lost, lost it in only two so far. Um, I think this cuts across liberal conservative, I think this cut, cuts across Democrat, Republican um, uh, sort of constructs, and uh, because I think no matter uh, what your politics may be, there's sort of a, a deep knowledge somewhere in our families that Native people have suffered more than any other people uh, in, this, in, in our history. And, and there's some justice that is due here. And people have Native bloodlines in their families and they remember this. So I would just say this is a, an issue whose time has come uh, and that we need to do what we're being asked to do by indigenous nations who live here today and uh, whose children go to the same schools that our children go to and whose voices have been raised now for many decades saying the symbol is hurtful to us. Uh, I've been at uh, hearings at the State House where Native mothers have been in tears in front of the center saying it is hard for us to send our children to the schools You know, where we have to march down the hall under this flag, there's a lot of pain and trauma uh, tied up in this symbol. And this state, this commonwealth, can do so much better, I do believe. And uh, with the help of Hatfield's town meeting upcoming, I think we will see a new flag and seal. And, and with that, I think we will see a much healthier dialogue uh, with the native people who have cared for this land, uh, for 10,000 years and from whose wisdom we could learn much at this time of climate crisis and species extinction uh, when, when we really need to learn, to step back and learn from the people who know how to care for this land uh, a better way to live that does not harm the land, does not harm the people who live upon it and provides a better future for all of our children. So. With that, I'd like to close and say thank you very much uh, for giving me the time to speak to you about this. And if there's any questions, I'm here to answer them. Yes? Has a design team been formed, or what kind of team will be designing the flag? I think I, I, I skipped over that uh, by saying it took 34 years, but finally they set up a commission. The legislature finally set up a special commission and invited Native people to sit on it. There are 19 members, and six of them are Native leaders, including the chairman of the Mashpee Wampanoag, the chairwoman of the Akina Wampanoag, the chairwoman of the Herring Pond Wampanoag, <coughs> and representatives of the Nipmuc and the Massachusetts are all seated now with a bipartisan group of state legislators and with historians, and the Secretary of State has a seat on that commission as well. And it's their charge to study this, and they have studied this, and to make a recommendation for any changes. And they have voted unanimously uh, last year in May <clears throat> to seek a totally revised flag and seal. And uh, you know we can all sit back and say, Whew, that was hard work, it took a long time, but it finally is happening. And yet, I wanna point out that they're just a commission to make a recommendation. And that recommendation will include, you know, a new design that will go to the legislature and it will be up to the legislature to say yes or no and this legislature has a long history of delaying on this issue and so every town meeting vote is going to be very important this year in particular. Um, long story short, the special commission finally has an extension on their deadline to come up with what the new artwork will look like and they have finally been given some money to work with. For a while they had no funds and they were running out of time. And uh, that's just been remedied about uh, three weeks ago when Governor Healy signed the supplemental budget bill. She granted them an extension and as part of that bill until November 15th of this year. And they now have some funds to actually to go around and do public <coughs> polling to see what each of us might think would be good elements in a new design. And um, 
also to commission some artwork to, sh to show a rendering of what, what the final consensus might look like after they've consulted with the people of the Commonwealth. There have been a couple of suggestions made uh, that I think are uh, just good to think about from the commission themselves. They said elements of nature would <clears throat> be most welcome, whether you're from a tribal background or not. And they talked about the white pine, which, you've, which we've already mentioned, which has deep significance to the Wampanoag. Their creation story really uh, goes right back to the white pine. And, um, <clears throat> and the chickadee has been mentioned and cranberries, cod, sometimes people refer to the, uh, the shape of Mount Greylock, named after a, a never defeated in battle native leader, Greylock, and um, the shape of the Commonwealth itself with the distinctive cape might also be part of the new flag. A lot of states are changing their flags right now because they are doing it for gra graphic potential. You, you can think of certain state flags that just stand out in your mind, like the state flag of California with the bear, or the state flag of Texas. Some of them are iconic, easy for an elementary school child to draw, for example. Uh, and, you know, Massachusetts is thinking about tourism as well, and they want an image that they can be proud of and say to everybody, feel free to come here. Uh, there's no sword over your head. Uh, for example. So um, this kind of seal that we're living with, which becomes our flag, is often called a seal on a bed sheet. You know, <laughs> like you, you get this huge white background and you can't even see the details of it from a, from a distance. So, so there's an attempt to come up with something more graphically appealing, like the state of Utah just changed their seal on a bed sheet flag into something much more uh, visually powerful, and I just want to also mention Mississippi was the other state where there were people struggling over the, let's just say the racial overtones of their flag, which up until 2020 and the murder of George Floyd, which caused a real reckoning uh, around institutional racism all across the land, as well it should such for such a tragic murder. Um, but even in Mississippi, which had resisted, you know, for 20 or more years, a, a real push to change their Confederate battle flag, which was their state symbol up until 2020. Um, mm. It took that terrible uh, tragedy and the, and, the, and the national reckoning that, that ensued for them to change their flag. And they consulted with Native people in Mississippi, the Biloxi tribe, among others, and came up with this beautiful magnolia flag, which Again, very visually striking and of significance to the native people there. So that's a good recent example for us uh, here in Massachusetts. I don't know what they're going to come up with, but I can assure you that if the native people on the special commission are in favor of it, I'm going to be in favor. And I think it'll be a beautiful symbol that we can all be proud of. Yes. Any other questions? Yes. Was there a website we can go to to, yeah. to read more about this? Sure. Uh, so we try to keep it very well updated with all the town meeting votes and all the city council votes, and that is changethemassflag.com, changethemass, M-A-S-S, flag.com. And uh, right on the home page, there's a big map uh, that you can actually, it's sort of interactive, so you can see the towns that are highlighted, that are about to vote. You can tap on the town of Hatfield on that map on the home page, changethemassflag.com, and it should tell you, I hope, accurately, the date and time and location of the town meeting. If you have friends, I don't know, let's just say in West Newberry or family, you can tap on that and see that West Newberry is about to vote on Monday night. And if you happen to know family in West Newberry, who might have neighbors that they could say, please go and vote for this. That'd be wonderful. So, yes, please go to changethemassflag.com, share it with your friends. And uh, this is a historically significant effort that we are undertaking. It's the first time in 140 years since this was passed into law that the Commonwealth is actually 
making a thorough review, and it wants to involve everybody's opinion. And uh, town meeting is one ideal way of expressing that opinion. And uh, you know, there are only a few states in America that have this kind of direct representative democracy where, where you can gather 10 signatures the way this heart group has done and bring an issue before the whole town and say, how do you feel? Uh, and would you like to see this changed or are you happy with it just the way it is? Hatfield may say, yes, we'd like to see it changed. Hatfield may say, no, we love it just the way it is. But either way, that's democracy in its purest form, I feel. So take advantage of this and please do come and please do vote. Thank you very much.